Good morning. Buenos dias. When I was a, an assistant professor at Harvard, a long time ago, 30 years ago, a young assistant professor, I never asked myself, by the way, I'm, I'm still young, I'm just not an assistant <laughs> professor anymore. I never asked myself, how am I going to teach? This is a picture of me, actually, back in the 80s, starting to teach at Harvard. It's a very old picture. It was taken B.C., before computers. I never asked myself, how am I going to teach? Which is a strange thing, right? When you do something new, that should be the first question you ask yourself. I simply did to my students what my professors had done to me. And in turn, they did what their professors had done to them, who did what their professors had done to them, and so all the way back to the Middle Ages. Now, I was asked to teach the course that none of my colleagues wanted to teach, physics for pre-medical students. These were not students who wanted to learn physics. No, they just had to learn physics. And they already hated physics before setting foot in the classroom. Now, most of my colleagues would come close to committing suicide at the end of the term because the students were not very kind to them. But not so for me. I got a very high evaluation at the end of the semester. And students did well on what I considered difficult exam problems. So very quickly, I started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. <laughs> now, that illusion, because it turned out to be a complete illusion, unraveled completely. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. So this is what I'd like to do in the next uh, 25 minutes or so. I'd like to talk a little bit about education. I know this is a conference about technology, and I, I love technology. But when it comes to technology and education, I think technology has done very little to improve education. The real emphasis should be on the pedagogy, the interaction, or as we just saw, the social aspects of learning. We will use technology, though. You all have a little clicker to vote in just a second. So I'll talk a little bit about education, and then I'll switch to peer instruction, which was sort of a precursor of the flipped classroom approach that many of you undoubtedly have heard about, which started in my classroom about 24 years ago. And I thought, since this is a conference on education and technology, I thought it'd be nice to engage you all. So we'll end with a little test. So you better pay attention, because the test will come at the end. So let's start by asking ourselves, what is it exactly that happens in a lecture? Take this picture of me teaching my pre-med education class. This is a very familiar scene. Wherever you go around the globe, whether it's Asia or Latin America or Europe or Africa or Australia or North America, you see the same scene repeated over and over again all across classrooms. I would like you to describe to me, and you'll have to speak out loud, I'll repeat it so that others can hear it too, what is happening on the screen behind me. Give me one or two words, not a speech, just one or two words. Ideally, it was a verb, but the two verbs I do not want to hear are teaching and learning. So you have to come up with other verbs. Go ahead, blurt it out. Reading. Writing, reading, okay. listening. I am talking. <laughs> Demonstration. Taking notes. Taking notes. Sleeping. Sleeping? <laughs> I told you this is a picture of my class. <laughs> but now that you mentioned sleeping, I can't resist quoting Albert Camus, who once said, some people talk in their sleep. <laughs> Lecturers talk while other people are sleeping. But, you know, this is my class. So notice that all of the verbs that we've heard so far refer either to me or to the students. Talking, taking notes, demonstrating, reading, sleeping. Can we find a way to capture the whole process? What is it that is actually happening here? Not just me or them, but both of us together. Boring. 
I told you already, this is my class. <laughs> Downloading. What is being downloaded here? Well, this is BC, so Facebook did not exist. I'm sorry. <laughs> the word downloading didn't even exist in, in 84. I heard somebody say information. What about information? What is happening to information here? It is being transferred from the speaker, from the instructor, to the students. And you know what? My students had actually pointed this out to me, but I had ignored it. See, the first year that I taught, I didn't ask myself, how am I going to teach? The question that did come up in my mind was, what, what exactly, or more precisely, what book? So I went to a professor who had taught the course before, and I asked him you know, about the book. And he said, oh, in this course, we use Halliday, the book by Halliday and Resnick. Now, I was told that in the US, all the students buy the textbook, which was not the case when I was a student in the Netherlands. So I had to go to the bookstore to make sure that they had 150 copies of the book in stock for the students. And as I walked back to my office, I thought, wait a minute. If I have the book and the students have the same book, then what, what do I do in the classroom? So I went to my colleague. I knocked on his door and I asked him that question. He said, oh, don't worry. There are lots of different physics textbooks. And he showed me a whole shelf full of books. And very quickly, I found the perfect book. It was perfect for two reasons. One, it was different from the book that the students were going to buy. But that was not the important reason. The important reason was the book was out of print. <laughs> so for every class, I spent you know, 10 hours preparing lecture notes, which in class I would either project on the overhead projector or I would write them on the board behind me there. And because my notes were different from the textbook, I decided to give my students a copy of the lecture notes. This was before the internet, so we couldn't just post them. So as the students walked out of the classroom, they could pick up a copy of the notes. Now, why do you think I hand them out at the end of class and not the beginning of class? So they would listen to me, but isn't that already admitting that there's a problem? Why force the students to get the information out of my mouth? if they could get it by reading the notes. That never came up in my mind. But you know what happened? At the end of the semester, about half a dozen students wrote on their evaluation questionnaires, Professor Mazur is lecturing straight from his lecture notes. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I mean, what was I supposed to do, develop another set of lecture notes to lecture from? I mean, these ungrateful students. Students had a point, however. I was lecturing from my lecture notes. And if they had read the book, they would have seen that the book was not that different from my lecture notes. Now, given that this model of teaching is used all around the world, one could ask the question, is that what education is? Kiran already touched on that. There's more to education than just the transfer of information. What is it? Let's hear it from you. In addition to transferring the information, what needs to happen? Interaction. interaction. But you know, in a lecture hall like this, there's very little interaction. Even in a room like this, it's really hard to have any interaction. Now, I'm working hard on trying to engage you and interact you. But typically, when people sit down in a room like this, you automatically take on a passive role. You expect to observe, to listen not to interfere. Imagine this were a play or a concert, you know. You'd be not very popular if you started making noises. But what is education? What needs to happen in addition to this transfer of information? Partnership. Thinking, partnership, and so on. I'd say the learner has to do something with that information. It's not enough just to put it in your head and then close your skull again. You need to assimilate the information, or Piaget would have called it accommodate the information, build the mental models that allow you to apply what you've learned in a new context. So the hard part of education really is not the transfer of information. It's the assimilation of that information. It's the aha moments, the I get it, or in the words of Kieran, I can. 
So what's the result of this passive model that I just presented and which I started teaching with? It's basically that students don't learn. It took me seven years to figure out that my students were not even learning the most basic principle in my course. I wish I could tell you more about it, but there's plenty of video on the internet that gives you the whole story. So no learning, no real meaningful learning. All that happened was that the students were taking it in a notebooks, rather. In fact, I heard somebody describe the lecture as a process whereby the lecture notes of the instructor get transferred to the notebooks of the students without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> and no wonder there's hardly any retention of useful knowledge or any development of useful skills. Because it's not the transfer of information that's the key. It's the assimilation of that information. So after discovering that my students weren't even learning the most basic principles, I said to myself, look, I should really not focus on this transfer of information. If you ask yourself, what is education really? It's one, the transfer of information. Without transfer of information, you have no education. But you need to go one step further. You need to assimilate, or at least give students an opportunity to assimilate that information. In the traditional approach to teaching, all of the emphasis is on step one, which takes place in class. Whereas step two, the aha moments, the putting things in context, the building the mental models that apply us to, that allow us to apply what we've learned into a new context, happens outside of the classroom. And that, of course, is the hard part. It's kind of ironic that in the standard approach to education, we're putting all of the emphasis, just as we did in the Middle Ages, before there were books, on the first step. We should focus on that second step. So back in the early 90s, I said to myself, we should really flip this around and do the transfer of information outside the classroom so that we, as teachers, can be there to help our students assimilate it. So how, there's a lot of talk right now about the transfer of information out of class, MOOCs, this, that, and the other. I don't want to talk about that. To me, that's the easy part of education. What do you do in the classroom in order to engage your students? And I want to show you something that is an easy way of basically transforming from a passive class to an active class without even changing the architecture. So it can be easily implemented in any type of classroom. And the idea is nothing new. Teach by questioning rather than by telling. Who was the first one to say that, by the way? Socrates, 2,000 years ago, already said, we should teach by questioning, not by telling. And here we are in the 21st century, and we're still mostly teaching by telling. Now, it was sort of an accident, because I, 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 it's, I can't say that I planned this. One day, I was trying to explain something incredibly basic to my students. I turned my back to them and I wrote on the board some simple explanation. And after two minutes, I turned around and I looked at them and I could see it from their faces that they were confused. So I asked them, is there a question? They were so confused, they could not articulate a question. So I thought, hmm, this is serious, you know. So I thought, let's do it again. So I erased the board. I started all over again. In the next eight minutes, I managed to produce the most brilliant explanation you could possibly think of. And by after eight minutes, the entire board was covered with equations and drawings. I was so proud of my, my explanation. I turned around. My jacket was covered in chalk dust, <laughs> only to see that they were even more confused. <laughs> and they could still not articulate a question. I didn't know how to explain it any better. They could not ask me a question. I knew one thing. I knew that on a quiz that they'd taken before, half of them had given the right answer. So in a moment of despair, I said to them, why don't you discuss it with each other? 250 students in the classroom, a room like this. Something happened that I had never seen before. Complete chaos. 
They all started talking. They forgot about me in front of the classroom. I mean, I could have walked away. They would not even have noticed. It's as if this big classroom had, taught, had turned into a kindergarten. And what happened was very surprising. In just two minutes, they figured it out. I thought to myself, how can that be? I, the expert, have taken 10 minutes to try to explain it to them, and they explain it to each other, and unsuccessfully, and they explain it to each other in just two minutes? But let's imagine two students sitting next to each other, John and Maria. Maria has the right answer because she understands it. John does not. On average, Maria is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply by the force of logic. But that's not the important point. The important point is this. Maria is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she has only recently learned it. She still knows what the difficulties are that a beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur has learned it such a long time ago, to him it is so clear that he cannot even imagine why somebody doesn't understand it. It's what my colleague Steven Pinker calls the curse of knowledge. Sort of an ironic statement, right? Because you tend to think of the expert as being the best person to teach it. When I saw this, I thought, boy, I should really turn this into practice. So now I teach by questioning. I tell my students before class to either watch a lecture or read the material or study on a project, do something. And then in class, I basically teach by questioning. Often the questions are already given to me by the students based on what they've done outside of the class. So I talk a few minutes, I ask the question, and then I give students to think. It's quiet. They can think for themselves. Then I polled them. Initially, we had no technology. Now there are clickers and there are mobile phone-based uh, technologies to poll them. We'll do that in just a second. And then I tell them, now, try to find a neighbor around you who has a different answer. And try to convince that neighbor of your answer. Complete chaos. But in just two minutes, they help each other figure it out, provided there are enough students who get it right the first time. So ideally, you aim your questions so that between 30% and 70% get the right answer the first time. More than 70% and, you know, they don't have much to talk about. Less than 30% and they can't teach each other. Then I poll them again. And then I either ask a student to explain it or a couple of students or I can provide my own explanation. And the cycle repeats until time is up. And of course, the learning takes place in this middle step there where the discussion happens in the classroom. You actually see aha moments. You see students go, oh, in class. Let's show a little video so of how this works. Loop so I started by reading the question to them. In the direction and uh, don't worry about the question, OK? I, I won't so test the question you on it. Is, and and what are um, the magnetic forces then on the I four different sides asked them to think loop. about it. So take a minute to think about this, and then enter your answers. So they think it's quiet. I do not want them to talk to each other. I can see on my screen how they vote. I do not show it to them. We they don't see that. Disagreement clearly here. So turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. Right. It goes out of the page on the top of his hands, right. and they cancel each other out. There is a torque. There is a torque. How do you know that? <laughs> I said torque. What did you say? But how can there be a torque? So it was a torque. Initially, we had sort of an even split. And now we have a absolutely overwhelming majority for choice number two. The bottom and of this loop is And it's not unusual to go you, from, uh, from you know, 50-50 to 90-10, with students effectively teaching one another. You want to try it? OK, good. I hope you all read that little piece that was in the, in the conference materials about thermal expansion. 
I'm, I'm just joking here. <laughs> I see a lot of people look very nervously through their materials. No, no. But you know what that means? That means I will need to lecture you briefly about it. You know, I'm actually very grateful because I never lecture in my own classes anymore, and I miss it. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thermal expansion is really important. It has to do with the fact that hard materials, solids, not soft materials or liquids or gases, but hard solids, expand, get larger in volume when they get hotter. And when they get colder, they shrink again. It's very important, you know, for example, this is a, a railroad somewhere in India that was not correctly put down. If you've ever been in a train at low speed, you've probably heard this clickety-clack sound of the wheels as they go from one section of the rail to the other. The reason they leave this gap between sections of the rail, tiny gap, is so that the rail can expand, has space to expand. If you don't leave that gap, bad things happen. Same thing, steel bail buildings, you need to take into account the expansion of the hard steel as the, it gets hotter. Next time you park your car in a concrete parking structure and you walk out of, your, of the garage, look down and you'll see that every 30 meters there's a rubber strip. So they leave a gap in the concrete which they fill with rubber so that the concrete can expand. Now, the reason hard materials expand is because they're made from atoms, and as a material gets hotter, the atoms get further away from each other. So this is cold, and this is hot. Cold and hot. That's all there is to it. You may wonder, this is not something I'm going to test you on, but just to satisfy your curiosity, you may wonder why it is that the atoms get further away from each other. The reason is that atoms don't sit still, they vibrate. And the amplitude of that vibration is what we call temperature. So these are hot atoms and these are cold atoms. Hot and cold. Now, if you vibrate over a larger volume, you need more space. So all the atoms push each other away as they need this additional space to vibrate back and forth. Because basically that vibration is what we call temperature. When you touch something that's hot, the strongly vibrating atoms there transfer energy to the atoms in your hand, which heats up your hand. It's not those nine atoms I've shown. It's all of them, the millions of billions of atoms that make up a solid. So, cold, hot. Questions, anyone? I, I knew I give very clear lectures, so thank you very much for reaffirming that. But you know, I'm going to test you on this, and I'm not just going to make this black and then ask you, when solids get hotter, they expand because the atoms, A, get closer together, B, stay the same distance. No, because that would be me transferring information to you, you transferring exactly that same information back to me. That's not what learning is. I'm going to see if you can take this idea of atoms getting further away from each other, all of them, and apply that in a different context. So you better ask me questions. Cold <laughs> and hot. Is it so clear? No questions at all? I know it's very early, Monday morning. Why is very good question? Why is the middle one not moving? Well, the answer to that is really simple. I made two drawings, one was nine atoms close together, another drawing was nine atoms further away to each other. I pasted them on top of each other and put the central atom right on there. So it's just an arbitrary choice. I could equally well have taken this atom here at the top left and put it on top of the gray one. Then what would have happened to the middle one? It would have moved down and towards the right. And this one, instead of moving up, if, if this black one was on this gray one, this one would have moved towards the right. And that one would have moved down. It's not the absolute position that matters. It's the distance to all of the neighbors. Remember, in reality, there are not nine atoms, but millions of billions of billions of atoms, even more than that. And the absolute position of any single atom is meaningless. So thank you for that good question. Any other question? Where do they go? 
Where do they go? Well, they base, that's what they do. They all get further away from each other, and that's why a piece of metal, when it heats up, gets bigger. And then when it gets colder, they get closer together and it shrinks again. They don't disappear. Okay, I think you're ready for the question. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you the question. You're going to think about it. You're going to take your little clicker. Maybe you're sitting on it. It was on your chair before you came in. And then press the button corresponding to the answer. And I will see on a little um, window. Oh, look at that. 42 of you have already been playing with your clickers. <laughs> see that? Look at that. 46 have already been pressing on buttons. Very good. So you will press a button corresponding to the answer you think is true. No talking to each other. If I hear you talk before I tell you to talk, I'm going to come to you with this microphone and ask you to tell everybody what you just said. <laughs> then when I tell you you can discuss it with each other, find a neighbor who has a different answer. So if you turn to your left and the person has the same answer, you say, thank you very much, and you turn to the person on your right. If that person also has the same answer, you turn to the person behind you. Do not talk to anybody who has the same answer. If you do not talk to anybody, if you just sit there like this, I will come and talk to you. <laughs> OK, so here's the question. Consider a rectangular metal plate. Let me actually reset the voting here with a circular hole in it. When the plate is uniformly heated, what happens to the diameter? Wait, I haven't even read the question yet, and already people are answering. <laughs> when the plate is uniformly heated, what happens to the diameter of the hole? Does it increase? Does it stay the same? Or does it decrease? I'm going to give you 90 seconds to come up with an answer. And if you are already among the 69, 70, 80 smart people, ask yourself, how am I going to convince my neighbor in terms of these atoms getting further away from each other that I am right and he or she is wrong? Shh. Remember, I'm going to come with the microphone to you and tell you, ask you to tell everybody what you just said. Individual commitment here. Thirty more seconds. Twenty. Fifteen. If by now you have not make, made up your mind, just make a choice randomly, okay? It's, it, nothing depends on this, your, your salary, or it's, nothing, nothing. No, it's, there's no risk here at all, okay? But you do have to commit yourself, okay? So please enter what you believe to be the most likely answer. Okay, we seem to be stuck at 290 here. So five more seconds. Four, three, two, your last chance to get it in. One and zero. Now find a neighbor who has a different answer and go ahead. You get five minutes to convince each other.
Hello. <laughs> you all got engaged. I mean, it's amazing. You should have seen how you were so busy, you didn't even notice what I was doing here. I'm sure that by now, many of you have forgotten that I'm not here to talk about thermal expansion. <laughs> the answer to this question doesn't really matter. I'm here to talk about pedagogy. Um, imagine, imagine I'd just given my little lecture on thermal expansion, and then instead of asking you this question, I would have said, let's now apply this to rectangular metal plates with circular holes in it. If you take one of these plates and you put them in the oven and you turn up the temperature, the plate expands and the diameter of the hole will... I'm going to keep you in suspense a little bit longer. <laughs> you would have been sleeping through this. Can you imagine anything more boring than metal plates with circular holes in it? But now, I bet you, you're dying to know what the answer is. Now, before I tell you the answer, <laughs> let's just briefly analyze what happened here. I asked you the question, you made up your mind, and then I had you make a commitment by pressing a button. And then after you made that commitment, I asked you to externalize that answer. You turned to your neighbors and you said you checked in with your neighbor. And something interesting happened, even though I didn't, usually I walk into the audience and listen, I didn't do this, but I could see it from the gesticulation. Right? All of you sat there like this. Right? You moved away from the answer, the fact, to the reasoning. Because it's not about the answer. It's about thinking. Science, understanding the world around us, everything, not just science, any endeavor that uses critical thinking. It's about the thinking process, not just about memorizing the answer and knowing the answer. But most importantly, you became emotionally invested about the learning process. If I were to tell you, oh my God, it's coffee break time, sorry, bye, you know, you'd come running after me asking me what the answer is. Okay, now before I can tell you the answer, you need to vote again, right? Because we need that second vote. So please indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. Even if you have not changed your mind, then you press the same button. But if you have changed your mind, indicate. So everybody, so we need to get up to 300 here. And then I can tell you what the answer is. So please indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. Even if you've not changed your mind. Okay. The correct answer, by the way, <laughs> I, have, I have some bad news for you. I thought I gave a pretty clear lecture about thermal expansion, yet only 25% of you got it right. And that's kind of low, right? Because that means in every group of four, there's only one person who has the right answer. Typically, when it's below 30, the method doesn't work that well. You should have done your reading before coming to this lecture. Anyway, the correct answer is, oh, look at that attention I'm getting here. There is not one person tweeting or texting. I've been following your tweets here about EduLearn. My phone has stopped buzzing. It was buzzing continuously while I was talking, but now there's not a single person texting, tweeting, or computer open. The correct answer is, I need a drum roll here. <laughs> Number one. Yeah. And look at that. Still only about a quarter correct answers. Now, I don't, I'm sure that by now, again, you're all thinking about thermal expansion. Look at that. People are talking again. Isn't it amazing how you can engage the human mind? We're all born scientists. You saw the, the little videos, the videos of the little children in Kiran's talk. We're all born scientists. Education does a very good job erasing that curiosity of the human mind. I've shown you, it's not that hard 
to turn it back on. Because if you can do it with metal plates with circular holes in it, <laughs> trust me, you can do it with anything. Now, I need to wrap up here. And I don't want you to lie in bed tonight at 4 a.m. <laughs> thinking, why does this hole get bigger? <laughs> so let me take one minute of my precious time here to explain to you. Imagine you have a jar of marmalade in the refrigerator. Glass jar, metal lid. The metal lid is a ring with a metal plate. You take it out of the fridge, you can't open it. What do you do? You run the metal lid under hot water, and the ring expands, the hole gets bigger. You say, that's unfair. You didn't ask about a jar. You asked about, OK. Well, imagine, can I borrow this for a second? Imagine we have not a metal plate with a hole in it, but a metal plate without a hole in it. We draw a circle with a pen. Now we put the metal plate with a circle in it in the oven. It expands. What happens to the diameter of the circle? It gets bigger. Everything gets bigger, and therefore the circle gets bigger too. You say, that's unfair. There's no hole. If there was a hole, the atoms would expand into the hole, which is what most of you actually answered. I'll show you what's wrong with that. Imagine that we go outside and we form a big circle holding hands. Each of those dots is one of us. We are the atoms at the edge of the hole. Now we all move inside towards the center of the hole. What just happened to the distance between us? It got smaller. It can't get smaller because our neighbor is shaking more. Remember, and we're shaking too more. We need to get further away from each other. The only way to get further away from each other, to make the distance bigger, is either to remove a few of us, but atoms don't disappear like that, or to make the hole larger. <laughs> you won't forget this. <laughs> OK, back to peer instruction. I wish I could show you the data, but we tripled the learning gains with this method at Harvard, and it has been reproduced in many different settings, at many different grade levels, from elementary school to high school, from Asia to Africa, to you name it. So it's not just a, a Harvard effect, so to speak. Let's briefly end by revisiting a lecture. What happens in a lecture? One is, it's hard to pay utmost attention. And recently, an experiment was done at MIT that really shed interesting light on this. They developed a little sensor you can wear around your wrist, which measures electrodermal activity. And in this paper, which is not about education, it's about this technology to measure electrodermal activity, they show that what you measure at the wrist is correlated to brain activity, which is not that strange, because you know our nerves are connected everywhere. Now, the great thing about this is you can wear it and go around your usual doings, and then at the end of the day, you can download the data. With an EEG, it'd be hard to do because you'd look kind of funny with electrodes in your head. Maybe an MIT student would do it, but you know, most people wouldn't. They asked a graduate student at MIT to carry this device for a week and then looked at the data. Here are the data. This is not a paper about education at all. And you can see day one at the bottom, and then day two, day three, day four, and so on. You can see periods of lots of electrodermal activity, and therefore brain activity, and periods of very little. I wanna, they also asked the students to keep track of the activity. Those are the little letters which you can read. I want to draw your attention to parts of the, lab, the trace labeled class. <laughs> the trace goes flat. Compare that to sleep, which is this highlighted region here. <laughs> in other words, students are more asleep in a lecture-based class than they are in their own beds. <laughs> There's one activity that matches class. What would that be? Think about it. About all the things that we do, what would one that would be very similar to class? Don't look at the screen, because the answer is on there. TV, here it is, watching TV. And this is something we've known for a long time. You put people in front of a TV and they go into a meditative state. Why? Because there's this constant flow of information. You can't think. You can't think in a class because the presenter is speaking. You either think or you listen. If you think, 
you can no longer listen. You start to daydream and you lose track. And therefore, it's better not to think and just listen and write down what you hear. And therefore, no cognitively meaningful activity takes place. What's more, you walk out thinking you know it. Everything looks clear. You thought you knew it about thermal expansion. But in reality, you had not had time to think about it. In part because you've not had time to be confronted with any misconceptions. So you walk away with this false sense of security. But in the end, it is just one big illusion. So education is not just about transferring information. It's not about students getting students to do what we do. Active participation is a must. If you're interested in more information, go to this social network of peer instruction users. Please join. It's free, and it allows you to connect with other peer instruction users. Also, before we leave for coffee, please leave the clicker behind. It does not control your TV or microwave or anything. So please leave it on the chair, and uh, I'll be happy to talk to you during the remainder of this day. If you want my transparencies, they're right there. You don't have to write it down. Just go to Google, enter my last name, M-A-Z-U-R, and then hit the I'm feeling lucky button, and you'll have a copy of my presentation. Thank you very much.